we are going to get ready for uh, for John. Uh, we're going to do a quick intro with John. Uh, he is going to get going at two o'clock. It looks like he is uh, uh, on the board, so we should be ready to go. Uh, John comes to us uh, from Acorn Wealth, as I had said. He's a master stock trader there. Acorn Wealth opened in 2007, and it's put itself, its company, in a position where one of the few places students can go to learn about powerful directional techniques directly from their mentors. Uh, John grew up in a family that was involved in the mining industry, uh, and they spent a great deal of time talking about fundamentals and stocks around the family dinner table. Uh, he was exposed to the stock market at a very early age. It's one thing that he and I would share in common. Um, and he would watch the way that the mining companies that he was so interested in would move uh, up and down and up and down. It really became evident to him at that point that the fundamental research that he was doing um, that were terrific moves for stock prices both up and down fundamentally um, didn't seem to account for those. He realized there was something beyond those fundamentals. Since John, then, John spent 11 years mastering the art of technical analysis as a method to find trading opportunities in the North American equities market. In using these techniques, John and the other senior traders at Acorn have been able to identify exit points uh, in the market prior to the crash of 2008. We all remember that back in June. Again, they saw the exit sign back in April of 2010, and most recently, uh, July 2011. So John's going to talk to us today about profitable trade targets, in particular, perfect as we roll into the summer months, how to find the powerful um, trading patterns available in the summer months, best news, using free online tools. So I'm going to throw it. John's PowerPoint is up there. Uh, I will be following John at 3 o'clock. I look forward to talking to everybody real soon. Thanks. Greg, thank you for such a wonderful, warm introduction. I think it's a, an honor to have you following me. <laughs> um, well, uh, good afternoon, good morning to everybody, depending on where in the world you are. Um, thank you so much for Cyber Trading University for having us today. Um, and it is a, a very exciting time. We're going into a pivotal point in the market now. Uh, we've obviously broken uh, out of the open range for June uh, as of a couple of days ago. We've, we're going into a potentially momentum stage in the market. So discussing what strategies work well at this current point is uh, going to be particularly valuable to all of the traders out there with your trading stocks or options. We're going to talk about what's working, what's not, and um, some of the things to be focusing on over the weeks uh, coming up. Um, just a, obviously the standard disclaimer up on the screen. Uh, we may be discussing some uh, uh, current live market conditions, but it is not a recommendation to buy or sell. So always take your own uh, uh, risk profile into account. But yeah, a quick introduction to Acorn. Greg did a great job of introducing us, but we, yes, we were uh, started back in 2007. We've been mostly focused on technicals, and um, um, primarily the most important technicals that we focus on is figuring out uh, where the smart money is going. You know, um, we all start out learning the uh, uh, the basics of the market, looking at moving averages and things like that, and uh, we grind our nails down to butts, looking for uh, you know good ideas and things like that, but I guess the main focus of where our research has been um, uh, orientated around is looking at where the smart money is going. So we can do all the research in the world, uh, but ultimately we need to know where the big money is going to support that idea or, or sell against it. And um, by tracking the smart money, we've been able to predict these kind of big turns in the market, uh, especially the recent breakout that we've seen, which uh, began building on May 21st. And we're talking about how that works uh, in the upcoming slides. But um, I guess the most important question that most people often uh, uh, struggle with is what type of trader you want to be and how all these different strategies that we're going to talk about and you've probably just been displayed today, how they fit into it. Um, most people kind of would be generally categorized by one of the three things, whether you're a day trader, a swing trader, or a long-term investor. But um, what we try to um, fit into is, is not, I guess, put ourselves in the category of a time-based trade, but a level-based trade or a target-based trade. And that's why we talk about uh, profitable trades and targets. Is um, uh, I'm not so concerned about whether my trade takes an hour or a day or a week. Um, what I'm more interested in is the levels. 
that it hits and the targets that we want to trade with. So um, what that comes back down to is, is being able to have a consistent strategy of, of uh, coming to those conclusions. And um, I, I guess the way that most people that I've at least worked with over the years uh, make their decisions is, is through a um, uh, more of a story-based process. So they're, 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 they're finding ideas primarily from news, from uh, tips from friends, uh, if you can get that uh, correlation to the picture. <laughs> uh, you know, newsletters, brokers, financial advisors, um, and things you're familiar with. And that's uh, a picture of Vancouver. That's where I'm sitting right now. Uh, so the, on their own, they're not inherently bad. There's nothing wrong with getting ideas from these these places, but the, the question really becomes uh, uh, a, a matter of timing, you know, because you can have the right idea, uh, but have the wrong time, and, and it could be a, a loss, it could be a losing trade. And um, so what we try to focus on, again, more is uh, how do we create a consistent, measurable, uh, or, or quantifiable way of making profitable picks, or profitable um, ways of finding ideas, because we can't always consistently rely on our good buddy Tim down the road to, to, to find a good stock for us. <laughs> and if we're going to trade consistently for income, for capital gains, whatever it is, we need to have a, a, a way of finding these ideas on, on an a, a, you know, ongoing basis. So um, again, this is why most people lose. So if you think about it, 95% uh, of traders are losing money. Well, what do we all share in common? I mean, there's a 50-50 chance of getting it right up or down, right? Uh, so why do 95% of people consistently lose on a 50-50 coin flip? Uh, because of these reasons. Because they lack that strategy. They, they, they don't have a, uh, a measurable, replicatable way to trade. And, um, and again, that's why it leads into these types of problems. So, um, you know, it's if you're feeling beaten up, and maybe that if you're one of those 95%, uh, these are probably some of the things that are distracting you. It's all the noise, because once again, if 95% of people are losing, someone's making money, and the way they make money, uh, if someone's going to make profit, someone else has to lose, and uh, generally it's by a lot of these things. It's the noise that uh, distracts you uh, into selling at the bottom and buying at the top. And in the summer months, this becomes uh, uh, even more so, because a lot of the retail trading comes out of the market, and you're left dealing face-to-face -face with the high-frequency trading algorithms and all these types of things. So let's get into uh, talking about the summer months. Uh, firstly, there's three types of markets, right? Uh, we can all agree that the market moves in three different directions. We've got up markets, down markets, and sideways markets. That's also a direction. So there's three ways the market can move. Um, you know, up, upward trending markets, pretty simple, higher highs, higher lows. Downward trending markets, the absolute opposite. And sideways, where we could be trading calendar spreads and, uh, and uh, credit spreads. But most people, even educated traders uh, are often only making money maybe in one direction, which is up. If they're a little more advanced, maybe the down direction. But if 95% of people are trading in the up, they're still missing out on 66.67 recurring <laughs> percent of the opportunities. So we need to start adopting uh, a mentality that you know we can make money uh, in all three directions. Um, but we need to be able to define what mode the market's in. So just like the market moves in three directions, it also moves in different personalities. Okay, so uh, when I say personalities, I mean um, the type of uh, the type of way that the stock moves around. So we've got two main categories that you can split that into. You've got Oscillating patterns, so oscillating patterns would be, you know, head and shoulders, uh, double, double tops, double bottoms, um, 
uh, rising wedges, descending triangles, all those types of things where you've got a, 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 um, a movement back and forth between two fixed points. And we're going to go more into that in a moment. Um, and then you've got momentum patterns. So we're either generally oscillating or we're in momentum. And, it, and if we're in a momentum mode, then we're dealing with um, a cup and handle formations, saucer patterns, frying pan patterns I've heard other educators talk about. Uh, you know, the, um, the type of things where the force behind the trade just breaks through higher and higher and higher. And so the, in general, what we want to do is, is start out with an understanding, uh, a general concept about all equities, that um, a, a stock or an index or an equity will generally never just change direction randomly. It's not a chaotic system. It's organized chaos. And a stock or equity or index, in my belief, will never change direction unless it's hit one of these three things. A horizontal support or resistance line, a trend line resistance, in other words, a diagonal line, or a moving average. And so your very first job when you approach the market or a trade is to figure out what that instrument reacts to. Because if you can start to see what of these three things determines the limitations of that instrument's movement, that's the first most important step to diagnosing what type of trade we have. Because this will tell us, firstly, is it a momentum stock or equity, or is it a oscillating equity? And once we figure that out, then we can draw on you know, the permutations or the, 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 the lines that appropriately um, discuss the movement. And depending on what pattern those lines make, will tell us what type of trade we have. Is it a head and shoulders? Is it a momentum trade? Is it a, uh, a falling wedge? So um, that's the most important step. So obviously, all of these different patterns that we have out there are, are valid. There's, there's hundreds of ways to make money in the market. There's no one right answer. But there are higher probability answers. And the, the first step in, in coming to these conclusions and knowing what we want to trade is to understand the, the differences in, in the DNA of these types of trades. So um, we've all had this experience, right, where, where you go out and you, uh, you learn. Uh, let's, say, let's talk about a momentum pattern. So you go out and you say, all right, well, how do we pick a momentum stock? All right, well, we want the, uh, we want the nine day moving average, stock to cross the nine day moving average. Let's get my pen out here. So we see the stock coming down, starts to consolidate, and uh, we go to the textbook rules of a momentum trade. And uh, what do we do? Well, we wait for the, the nine day exponential moving average for the stock to cross it. Right? Maybe we wait for the 20 day to confirm. Right? We turn to our, uh, our, our strength indicators. We look for the, the RSI to go up over the 30 line. We look for our MACD to start going positive. You know, these are the types of things that are tried and true methods of looking for momentum, right? Directional movement, ADX. So, and it works well. The stock starts to stock starts to climb, and as it does, it should continually bounce off of those moving averages, and up it goes. And that's a momentum trade. That's the kind of things that uh, excuse me. That's the kind of things that we want to be doing if we're trading momentum. You know, we're looking at all of those factors. And the moving averages then become the support system. And because we can recognize that the stock is continually bouncing off of them, we can diagnose them as momentum. And once we've done that, momentum then lends itself to continually breaking through all of those kind of horizontal levels that we might find uh, above the stock as it interacts with those levels. 
Now, the problem is that a lot of traders learn these techniques. They, they, they do the, the MACD, the RSI, stochastics, blah, blah, blah. Works great. Then all of a sudden, you get into uh, um, uh, a market, especially typically during the summer, where things go sideways, and all of a sudden, it stops working. All of a sudden, this, this pretty picture that we painted on the screen changes. And uh, instead of this kind of nice drop and recovery, this kind of saucer pattern, instead, we start to see things more like this. You start to see the stocks dropping. They, they hit a support point, and it goes straight up. And it crosses over your moving average. And you buy. You say, yes, it's on a recovery. We've had a big drop. We've got a dead cap bounce here, maybe a, a, a nice 20 30% push from here. And immediately the stock, almost the second you buy it, and if it, you've had this before, right? Like you feel like you're looking over your shoulder and feeling like the market's watching you. And the moment you push by, it sells. And you stop down. And the, the, this is a common thing that people struggle with because they're trying to uh, apply their momentum strategies onto what's probably an oscillating stock. And that is one major reason why people fail. It's not just the summer months, it's just in trading in general. Uh, without having a, a way of splitting up your analysis thought process and understanding these are categorically different trades, you're going you're gonna to fail. Because everything that you use on a momentum stock, you know, so let's say, we, again, you're looking for RSI to go above 30. You want the directional movement things to cross. You want the ADX above 25. Great. Doesn't work on an oscillating stock. Uh, the recipe is different. So as soon as we recognize that the stock doesn't obey its moving averages, that we have sharp reversals, then we know that we're dealing with a, an oscillating trade and we need to employ different things because the stock is not going to respect the moving average. Instead, it's going to respect outer limits. And that's why we need to figure out what those limits are. Okay. So as soon as we start to figure that out, now we can employ a completely different approach where we're looking at Bollinger Bands, looking at CCI, looking at, uh, uh, instead of looking for the RSI to be going up above 30, we want it to be as close to zero as possible when we buy because we want it to be dropping like a knife. And we want to catch that at the bottom. So let's, let's push forward. So think about that. Uh, what exactly uh, are you looking for? Uh, do you have, uh, how many people here do have uh, a differentiation between their momentum trades and their oscillation trades? I see John uh, mentions here that he's, uh, he's struggling with this also. Yeah, most, a lot of people are. Uh, you do need to have differentiations. Um, your toolkit as a trader is, um, or your profitability as a trader relies on you being able to know what type of trade is best today. So um, when you start out your week or your day, it's just like getting up in the morning. You look outside the window, you say, is it, is it sunny? Great, I'm going to put a pair of shorts on. Is it raining? Okay, I'm going to have an umbrella with me, uh, hopefully. <laughs> uh, same thing with the market. You've got to look out and say, is the market oscillating or is it momentum? And um, I'll give you a real brief snapshot of what I mean by that. I'm going to bring up my old friend, uh, Paint. <laughs> um, let's, let's, let's talk about this. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Let's take, let's take an example, very, very basic example. Let's say that we have four different conditions in the market. Okay. <laughs> E-Trade, baby. That's a cute commercial. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's say we've got four different conditions, all right, A, B, C, and D. So the first question that we want to ask when we, when we look at a market is not are we bullish or are we bearish. Bullish or bearish is such a subjective question, and you want to really get away from subjective questions because um, 
it, it'll, the answer will change completely depending on who you ask. And your opinion will change completely depending on who you're listening to, how good your week is going, and whether you fought with your wife this morning or your husband, respectively. Uh, it's a subjective approach, and, it's, uh, and that can be, that's open to human error, which is your worst enemy. So we want to try and get away from that. The question I would suggest you ask is not, are we bullish or bearish, but rather, are we at support or resistance? And if you have been, if you've, if you've trained yourself well, or if you have been trained well by somebody else, or one of these uh, um, uh, uh, top-notch education institutes that are part of today's summit, then you should know that trend lines are really not subjective. There's a process-driven method that should have all traders drawing those trend lines and those Fibonacci's at the same place. So once you've drawn those in, we then allow ourselves to answer the question of, are we at support or resistance? So let's say that we've got you know, these scenarios where stock is at resistance, okay? Well, let's, let's do the opposite. Some people don't know how to short this. I, I'm a, I love contrarian trade, so I, I always talk about shorting. <laughs> let's talk about longs. Let's say we're here, okay? I'm going to save myself some work. I'm just going to duplicate this. Okay, let's, we've got these four different situ situations. So in scenario A, if we look at the S&P 500 and we say to ourselves, okay, we are at support. The question that we now need to know is, do we have momentum or do we have oscillation? So one thing you can do is you can go and bring up, for example, example the uh, check and money flow. And you can then see, all right, what's the distribution or accumulation of the flow? You can do this with MACD, you can do this with any momentum indicator. Um, and you can say, okay, between these two lows, uh, is money flow at higher highs on equal price? And if so, then we have signs of momentum to the positive direction. Now, if we have, in this case, this would then be a big tick that the stock is going to reverse. In a second scenario, we can then look, okay, as we start to get into the support zone, if we have money flow doing the opposite, we've got ourselves negative momentum or a, a loss of uh, movement and potentially a breakdown. So this is how we then apply mo money flow to diagnose if we have momentum or oscillation within the, within the instrument. Now in the, in the third and fourth scenario, let's just get rid of these. In the third and fourth scenario, we then start to look at things such as moving averages. So the first thing that's going to give momentum is money flow. Does the smart money agree with the trade or not? The second thing that we're going to look at is the, the, the controlling methods that move the stock. So it would seem quite clear that if we were to look at this hypothetical example, the stock is um, struggling with breaking outside of the realm of its uh, its horizontal or static limitations, these, these, these fixed lines that just do not let the stock pass. You shall not pass, <laughs> to quote uh, Lord of the Rings. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, pun aside, <clears throat> that's what we need to figure out. We need to figure out what the unstoppable force is. Now, in this situation on the left, if we can see that there is a history of this stock constantly bouncing between and it might not just be the horizontals, it might have come out of a consolidation pattern prior to, right? It might have come from a channel. We might see something a bit more like this. 
And if you see this, don't touch your moving averages. Don't look at your MACD. You know, turn to your oscillating indicators. Stop waiting for confirmation. Trade the limits, not the movement within. Okay, because that's, that's an oscillating trade, and it follows different rules. Now, the, the flip side is something a bit more like this. <coughs> Excuse me. The flip side uh, is rather than seeing something like this where moving average is probably just cutting through the trade. And that's what, that's what your, the number one key is in diagnosing momentum is, uh, excuse me, uh, oscillation, is if the moving averages don't work. So, and we're going to look at some live examples here in a second. But if you look at a stock and you see that the moving average really doesn't work. In other words, if you were to bet your life on the fact that that stock will not cross that moving average, and it does, Look for different trades. So people often get confused as why. Well, what I mean by doesn't listen to, uh, what I mean by when I say doesn't listen to the moving average is, uh, look at how many times the stock interacts with it. So if you see a stock, and we'll bring this up on the screen in a second, if you see a stock that touches the moving average 20 times, its daily low hits it 20 times over. And not a single time, though, does it ever cross it, then it's listening to the moving average. If the stock just moves with it, but it's constantly breaking up and below it, like a knife cutting through butter, then it's not listening to it. So this would be an oscillating trade. In scenario B, If you get something a bit more like this, now we're dealing with a momentum trade. And this is the type of scenario where traders get, traders get trapped because you'll see maybe the stock rally up, hit that resistance, and the technical analyst in me then wants to look at that and say, ah, it's that resistance. It's a great short. Good shorting opportunity. But then you start to look at the fact that this momentum system is behind, and you realize that the probability now, in fact, because it's momentum, is that it will, in fact, breach that resistance and be a better ascending triangle or breakout trade. All right. So that's my little... Uh, drawing board example. So the fact that most people don't differentiate is why people lose money. Uh, they, uh, they don't have a, a toolkit. And you should. You should say, if it's a momentum market, here's my strategy. If it's an oscillating market, here's my strategy. And then know how to place these targets. Um, so where does all this come from, I guess, is, is also an important question to discuss. Where does the... <clears throat> Where does these, uh, where do these patterns originate from? Why do they work so well? Um, and, and that question comes back to looking at where volume and the control of the market is. Um, uh, clear statement, volume controls price. Uh, without volume, price won't go anywhere. So who dictates that? Where, who is trading the most amount of volume in the market? What strategies do they use? And I would argue it's the smart money that controls it. So essentially 70 to 80% of all of the trades are now estimated to come or are derived from algorithmic functions. So essentially uh, computer bots that are pre-programmed to buy and sell based on rules. Now, does this mean that they have 80% of the money? No, but they account for it. So in other words, if you have 100 grand, you buy a stock on Monday and you hold it, you account for a hundred grand of volume. Whereas let's say that there's another trader, let's say it's me, I got a thousand bucks and I buy that same stock as you, but then I sell it three seconds later. How much volume do I account for? Two thousand. But what if I do that a hundred times in that same day? How much volume do I now account for? Two hundred grand. 
Right? So with one thousand dollars, I now account for a, a two hundred percent of your footprint with a hundred thousand dollars. And you know what? I'm also fifty times faster than you because I have set up my office with a super quick connection to the stock exchange right next door. So not only do I account for twice your footprint, I don't even have to trade because I can put bids and asks into the market that I never intend to fill. Orders on stocks that I'll never buy. And with that, I create influence. And this influence is why patterns are so consistently profitable. <clears throat> and billions of dollars are made by them. Um, you know, you, you only have to look at the flash crash of May 2010 to see that. Uh, you can't send an entire stock market down a thousand points and send it straight back up in the opposite direction if you don't have amazing power that is completely automated. Humans don't trade like that. They don't react that quickly. <laughs> right? Um, same reason that uh, you know the, the, the market got shut down recently, the NASDAQ, because someone apparently tripped over a power cord. That's rubbish. No one tripped over a power cord. There was the flash crash happening, and they shut it down. Um, and, and the beauty about this is so you're sitting there saying, well, John, great, thanks for scaring the hell out of us. What, what do we do then with all of this uh, stuff out there? Well, the answer is that it's really not that tough. Right? What's tough is emotional decision making because you're constantly looking at an, an inf infinite amount of sources to try and make sure that you're right. And the market knows that. They know you're emotional. <clears throat> you start to scratch that surface away and look at what's driving all the movements. You can see that it's just rules. It's computerized rules. And anything that does, any person, any computer, anything that happens the same way hundreds if not tens of thousands of times again and again and again is reverse engineerable. The trick is realizing that we don't need to be good at everything. So if there's 150 patterns out there, great, but let's focus on maybe three or four and figure out what those common symptoms are that makes up the fingerprint of how the smart money buys. And that's what we focused on. We don't want to be great at everything. Well, we'd like to be, but it's pretty hard. We want to be specialists in figuring out what the high probability patterns are in summer, in winter. And then the next step was to then look at thousands of trades that looked exactly like that and find out what they all had in common when they went up. And likewise, look at what all the ones that did look like that that failed had in common. So what are the common criteria of winning trades? And what's the common criteria of, winning, of stocks we thought were winning trades that lost? And then you build this fingerprint. And you, you start to come to a realization that when you start to see all these common criteria, you realize that algorithms <coughs> don't see charts like this. Uh, coming back to my comment earlier today, algorithms don't decide if they're going to be a day trader, a swing trader, or a long-term trader, all they care about is this, levels. When do I buy? When do I sell? And if you go back and look at high volatility markets such as 2008, it was a trader's dream. The market didn't change. The market still moved exactly as it should, following the exact same rules uh, mostly, that it follows now. The difference was, instead of it taking three weeks for the pattern to play out, it took three days. And I, I think that was basically the average change. Uh, our average trade went from 14 days, market days, which is three weeks, to four. But the profit on the trades in those four days and the pattern was exactly the same as what was normally taking three weeks. So what we try to um, pass along is don't force yourself into a time constraint box, put yourself in a target constraint box. And if you look at things like the flash crash of May 2010, you can see that example. You can see where markets have uh, pulled back when they crashed that thousand points on the Dow, 
this is the S&P, but when we crashed down from 1180 down to 1060, we rallied off that exact same floor that previously prevented that first nasty drop in February. So as we go into summer, uh, or looking at oscillating patterns, the first step with oscillating patterns is to look at levels. We ignore the moving averages, and we look at where are the uh, horizontal or trend line based restrictions on the stock. And if we want to talk about, again, the smart money, um, we'll realize that uh, com if we get a track computerized buying, it buys on yes, no equations. Is the price here? If so, buy. Is the price here? If so, sell. And when it does that, it reacts quickly, just like the flash crash. It's an instantaneous thing. So when we're looking at an oscillating pattern, and this is very valuable often in the summer months, we're, uh, our first step is to see, well, where are the strongest levels that the stock bounces at? <clears throat> and so um, when we see a stock dropping, the first thing we want to see is we want to think that we're reverse engineering what we're trying to look for, that computer print, fingerprint. And a computer doesn't buy like this. That is retail. That is institutional. That is pension funds. That is mum and dad down the road. We don't care about that if we're looking for oscillating trades. What we're looking for is we're looking for this. Now, this is an oscillating pattern. It's a, it's a place where the a horizontal level of such strength has been hit that the red lights turn to green and buying occurs. And the, the key things that we want to look for in an oscillating pattern is we want to look for sharp, aggressive reversals. We want to look at how quickly and how fast the stock dropped. How much did it drop? How much volume is in the company? Because if that thing drops and it trades 30 million bucks a day, and it drops 30% over three weeks, and it hits a, some kind of magic level and goes straight back up, then that is the kind of move <clears throat> that can only happen if 80% if of the market says so. And <laughs> where does 80% of the market come from? The smart money. So if the smart money is behind that trade, then you can bet your bottom dollar that it's not just using this level once. So once we've identified this kind of dagger in the line, we wait then for the second occurrence. And that's our trade, right there. So we're looking for sharp, aggressive reversals. We're looking for decent volume in the stock. And we're looking for a big percentage move, or a powerful move, from that level. And then we're looking for the very next time that, that occurs. So a fresh level. And the rule that I use on an oscillating trade in the summer is it has, it has to have only happened a maximum of two times before. So your third time is your last opportunity to trade. After that, the strength of this level is probably getting weaker and weaker each time it's hit. And on the fourth test, this is where you get a breakdown. And, uh, and you might recognize this pattern as a descending triangle. And that's why a descending triangle is bearish, because it's a bouncing ball, losing momentum, that finally falls to the floor. It all comes back to understanding this stuff. <clears throat> all right. So, when we're looking at um, when we're looking at a hypothetical stock, this is your first test, everybody. I'm going to put you <laughs> I'm going to put you back in high school. <laughs> um, if you look at this, applying everything we just talked about, what would you think would be then the best trade? Because this is what you want to get to. When you look at a stock, you shouldn't be asking yourself, "What should I do with the stock today?" That's the wrong question, because now you're pigeonholing yourself into the idea that you have to trade it, and you don't. There's 8,000 tradable stocks in the US plus 
or 8,000 that I scan anyway, that you can, you can work with. Why deal with one and figure out what the best trade is on that? Because maybe there isn't the best trade. The question you should ask when you look at a stock is, where would I trade it? Like a poker player. You don't look at your hand and find you've got a 2-8 off suit in your poker hand and say, um, how should I play this hand? A good poker player doesn't do that. A poker player says, I'm not going to play this hand because it's not two aces. The difference is in poker, you have to pay to see your hand with blinds. In stocks, you don't have to pay anything. You get to see your hand for free. And you can get 8,000 of them a day and pick the best one. So do you know what hand you're looking for? That's the question. So when we look at the screen, which hand do we like the best? Would we go long at A? Would we go long at B? Would we go short at C? Or would we go short at D? What do you think is the highest probability hand or trade in this hypothetical example? What would you trade? B and C. I, I love. I love the. Uh, we've got so many different answers. <laughs> it's great. That's what makes trading interesting. Okay. So, what I would have picked. I can see there's a lot of A and D, A and B and C. Wonderful. And this is why there's no one right way to trade because everyone's going to be different. What I would suggest though is the highest probability trade here is A. And the reason I would say A is the highest probability trade is for these reasons. Number one, A is the strongest level. When A was hit before, it went up one, two, three levels. So we've got an evidence of big money. Because big money, the really big money, isn't interested in just a, a, a one level move. Because if big money is getting in and they're going to buy a hundred million bucks worth of the position, they have to sell it too. And when they just getting into the position is probably what's going to make it move up in the first place. And in order to make profit, they have to get out. So they get in there and get out here. So there needs to be room for movement. So firstly, we want an aggressive level. So A is the best because it goes up the most. B would be the second choice because like A, it is the second most powerful. It drops two levels. And the final reason why A is the best is because it's also the freshest. So it's gone it's only been tested once. And the more times that support gets tested, the weaker it becomes. Right? Just, just think of it like a football game. These are just like patterns in a game. If I was a coach and I've got my playbook and I threw three Hail Marys in a row, do you think the other team isn't going to get wise to it and figure out what I'm doing? Of course they are. And in the stock market, the coach is the market maker, and that's who you're competing with. And as soon as they realize that you can see the pattern, the pattern changes. So we want to be ahead of it. So these are the things you want to look for. Here's your checklist, especially in the summer. Oscillation, when you get oscillation markets, you want to be looking for these things. High probability zones, strong levels, fresh levels, powerful levels, a quick, fast reversal, and then what you want to do is you then want to go through your sectors and see if they correlate. Question from the audience. I think this is a good one to raise. Uh, a level, after being tested multiple times, doesn't it become a wall? It's a great question because someone asked me this in a, in a class the other day. They said, uh, they said I have two, two different um, tuitions. I have uh, one person told me, the more times that a level was tested, the stronger it is. And the other coach told me that the, the more times it's tested, the weaker it is. Well, it's kind of like a, um, 
it's it's kind of like a very kind of chicken to the egg <laughs> question because let's say that you, uh, let's say that I gave you a pane of glass and I took a rock hammer and I tapped it ten times and after the tenth time it hadn't broken yet. Well, then we know it's a pretty strong piece of glass because we've hit it ten times and it will break. But do you think that that glass was stronger? on the 10th time that I hit it, or the first time? I would argue it was the first time. Even if it was strong, and that's why it lasted 10 times, it was stronger on the first, second, and third than it was the seventh, eighth, and ninth. So no matter how strong that level is, it's always gonna be stronger earlier on than it is on the later tests. And that's why we look for uh, fresh levels. All right. So, um, examples of trades like this, Aaron's, great example. Uh, this is uh, something where you can see the smart money really in effect. Uh, 30 million bucks a day, this stock trade. It's not like it's not your, uh, your local coffee shop. This is a big, this is a reasonably good sized company. And when you can see reactions where the smart money steps in and it goes from 2450 up to 28, then you know there's a fingerprint there that's worth watching. And you can see that happens again over here the stock gaps down on big volume, opens at 24.50 and shoots straight up once more to the exact same price it went to before. You don't get 30 million bucks a day moving with that type of precision unless it's orchestrated. And because it's orchestrated, you can tag along with the trade as well. So then again, you might notice that we also get a very significant move here. So if for those of you at home that said, ah, maybe I'd be interested in that level, you'd be right. Because look again, it comes over here, and shoots up to 30 bucks off 26.50 a little bit further in the year. This is uh, 2013. And have a look again. We now get a third touch at 26.50. Where does it go? Exactly the same place it went to before. So these are oscillating trades. And when you're dealing with oscillating trades, it's, it's completely target-based. You're saying, where's the smart money highly probable to buy? And where is it highly probable to sell? And then what I do is I just simply do, I do most of my work at night, 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening. That's when I set my trades up, because I don't put my bracket orders in, and I let my strategy manage itself. So sell and may and go away, absolutely. Do whatever you want during the day, and if you're trading oscillating patterns, they just manage themselves because they, you don't need to watch them. You've got those sets already in place. And when you go then to your indicators, instead of looking at an RSI and a MACD and, and things like that, moving averages, instead now you're looking for extremes. You're looking for CCI, Keltner bands. Um, uh, you're looking for divergence in the MACD instead of direction. You're looking for uh, RSI being as close to 100 if you're shorting or as close to zero will be going long as possible. You're looking at money flow. You, these are the kind of things that you, that you now look at and you look for signs that momentum is not in play. And the final thing that you do is you then adjust your risk reward. So most people in a momentum market wait for a stock to confirm the movement before they buy, and that is correct. In a momentum trade, that's exactly what we do too. But if you're dealing with an oscillating market, or an oscillating stock, it's the opposite. Because if the stock's only gonna go from here to here, let's say that's 11 bucks and that's 10. If that's the pattern, that it's highly probable, and we don't know, Maybe it goes higher, but we're not going to take that risk. We're looking for high probability trades. We're going to get out here at, say, 10.93. So if we're going to get out at 10.93 and we wait to get that emotional confidence that the trade, that we're right about the trade, and we don't buy it until, until you know, let's say 10.25, and our stop loss is down here, at say 9.93, then 
So what's our risk reward? Well, we get, let's say we're selling at 1093. I always use odd numbers because I hate being part of the herd because that's how market makers mess with you. But so um, we look at um, uh, look at the entry. So we've got uh, 25 to 993. We've got a uh, 30. What are we doing? 25. So we're dealing with a 32 cent risk versus 1025 to 1093. We're dealing with an 80. What is that? 88. No. Doing that incorrectly. We're dealing with a, um, a 32 cent risk for a 68 cent gain. So our risk reward is basically two to one. <laughs> I love how everyone in the audience got the wrong two. <laughs> well, must be too early for me. Um, yeah, so the uh, 68 cent gain, so we're dealing with two to one risk reward, right? Now, what do we gain from waiting for that confirmation? We gain what we feel is insurance, a, a pat on the back that we're right. So our probability also is higher because it has started moving in the direction we want it to. But for that extra probability, you now have to get it right more often than you're wrong because you're paying for it. Versus in an oscillating pattern, you, do not, you should not wait for confirmation. You get in as close to the limit as possible. So instead of 10.25, we want to be getting in at 10.05. And now, and the stop loss is the same, because it should always be the same, to, regardless of your trade. We don't get to dictate where support is. It's the same. So we get in, same stop loss, 9.93. But the entry is lower. Our target is also the same, because we don't get to dictate where resistance is. And now, instead of 9, 90, uh, 9, 10.25, now we're at 10.05, so we deal with a different type of um, risk reward. We've got a 92 cent, excuse me, um, we're dealing with 95 minus 5, so we're dealing with a 90 cent, excuse me, 88 cent profit for a 30, uh, now for a uh, it's, um, 13 cent risk. So now we have a 6.7 risk reward. So by giving up this, uh, clinging to this confirmation that we always want, now we get the opportunity to get it wrong six times and only get it right once and still break even. I'll give up a few percentage points of probability for that any day. Wouldn't you? A two to one to an almost seven to one? I think it's a good trade. So when we're dealing with oscillating markets, we also need to understand that we don't only look at different indicators, but we also change the way we approach entries and exits to a more of a strict rule-based strategy. And the beauty of that is that with a strict rule-based strategy, you don't have to watch it so much. You really can sell in May, go away, but keep trading. There's nothing better than going away on a vacation and have your money managing itself while you're doing it because you have strict money management rules. And the beauty about that is that they're always the same. The final checkpoint that you then want to look at is where is the smart money going? And, um, and this is where we start to look at uh, um, key characteristics of stocks which is looking at, you know, ultimately, when something's rallying, is the smart money or is the, the, the big boys and girls, are they holding it? Are they holding and accumulating stock into that rally? Uh, or are they getting out? And one of the best things about looking at smart money is you really can use it on anything. You want to look at the S&P 500 and look at where we are at today. I'm just going to take these off here for a second. This rally, this breakout, is something that you should have seen coming weeks ago. For those of you who have never looked at the Dow Jones World Index, go to DJWO. 
DJW, Dow Global Index. It's basically a summary of all the worldwide indexes. If you look at what happened on May 22nd here, you can see it looks a lot like the S&P, but the Dow Jones Global broke out weeks ago. And if you reflect that back onto the S&P, there's uh, May 22nd, go to the S&P 500, May 22nd is here. And that, if you look at the, the two differences, when the global markets broke new highs, this was when the S&P 500 changed personality. So for the last few weeks, the S&P 500 was, in, through this entire time, was oscillating back and forth. The moving averages don't work. They cut right through the stock. Instead, it listens very consistently to its limitations. So you're selling, buying. But as of this day, you'll start to see that for the first time since the rally in February, the markets are listening to their moving averages. So we've had a change in personality. So we've gone from oscillating to momentum. And this is going to build to a point, and then potentially we're going to switch back into an oscillating market. So this is one key thing. And the way that you actually would have also known this, again, as I mentioned, is looking at the smart money. So when you apply the money flow indicator, and this is one of the indicators we used, this looks at, is the stock closing in the top half of its range? Is volume increasing when it closes in the top half of the range? And is it making higher highs and higher lows? And you can see that in the first time, in a very long time, this was actually getting greater. And so as the market started to make these climbs, this was also your key signal to know that we were breaching higher. So the final thing to look at when you've got all this stuff in place is what's the money flow doing? And this is basically how we trade. And if you put all this together, this is how you build a strategy. So when you go about a trade, you have every single step should be the same. Know exactly why you're getting in, exactly why you're getting out. Um, and when you start becoming rule-based, you start becoming efficient. So rather than doing things the old way, you start allowing money to manage itself. That is what an investment should be. It's money working for you, not you working for your money still. Um, and that's, the, I think, the, the conundrum that you really need to... Uh, uh, start thinking about Joel, the symbol for the Dow Jones Global is DJWO. Um, and then what you start to be able to do is once you know exactly what you're looking for, you can scan for it. As my business partner says, if you do the same thing more than once in a day, you should design a program that does it for you or hire somebody to do it for you if it's the same thing every day. And that's what we do. We design, we design scans, probably the thing that I'm proudest of. I wouldn't trade if I didn't have scans. I have no interest in looking at hundreds of stocks every day or doing research that's already been done for me by the smart money. So what we do and what I like the most about what we do is, is scan. So each night we run a scan that detects these patterns where the smart money is stepping in, where we're at a strong, strong support level, like Aaron's, where those high, high probability of it rallying 20, 30%. Now, we're not going to probably look for the 20, 30% gain. We might take the first 10 or 12% of that. But these scans will search for everything that we've looked for and talked about today. Um, how do you learn that? Basically, it's all through the sell and may go away process. The next four months will be, are currently kind of exciting but you need to have targets in place. And uh, we're doing, um, in conjunction with the, today's event, we're offering a two-hour workshop where we give you these scans, searching for the smart money, 
Um, we basically will be setting you up with uh, the scan you can run on your computer. It's using free online tools. The program I just showed you is uh, free to download. And we also uh, have um, all these scans set up in Metastock, TC2000, Think or Swim. And so uh, basically when you come to this workshop, you're going to get the scan that finds these patterns where the, um, the oscillation is really in gear. And we're also going to be, we, get, we actually teach you three scans in the workshop. And these three scans are the ones that we basically primarily only trade in summer. We do a Q&A, we'll be analyzing live markets, and we'll also be picking our top stocks for the next day. It's actually next week, Wednesday, June 11th, only 47 bucks. Uh, it took me 10 years to figure it out, so for $47, you're getting a, a great option into that. And um, if you, uh, I, I've rarely found that people haven't been able to walk away and immediately apply everything that you've learned. If you don't find it valuable, you let me know and we'll rebund you the money. We, so, looks like we're uh, coming to the end of our time here. We're at, uh, at the hour point. So if you do have any more questions or anything that I haven't covered, uh, I'll be sticking around for the next uh, hour listening to uh, Greg's great presentation. So you can always email us or give us a call. And um, for those of you asking what was the best stocks that came up in our scan, you can check it out. YouTube.com forward slash Mr. Aussie John. We picked six stocks, posted it on YouTube on Thursday, and uh, you can just check the video out to see how well they did on Friday. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. It was a great audience, and uh, thank you so much again to uh, CTU for having us. It was a pleasure. Hope to see you all on uh, Wednesday. Thanks, John. That was great, and as I anticipated, this is going to be a tough act to follow, guys. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I would echo John's sentiments there. I can't imagine uh, from what he gave you as a look uh, that joining him on the 11th uh, for $47 wouldn't pay for itself probably in a trade or two. Uh, in fact, when I go into my introduction here, when I load my slides in, John will be one of the few people that, uh, being from Australia, that will actually recognize the university <laughs> that I got my master's degree from. So 